Welcome to part seven of our series on the cross of Jesus. On, in this session, we're going to be talking about the labor of the cross. The cross was a work zone. It's God at work. Jesus is laboring on the cross to fulfill our redemption. There's a scripture that goes like this. Isaiah 53, 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. The Father saw the labor of Jesus' soul on the cross, and he was satisfied with the labor of Christ's soul. So Jesus is laboring on the cross. He's working real hard. He's absorbing all of the wrath of the Father against sin. He's satisfying the heart of his Father, and he's paying the price for our redemption. It's a labor of love. The labor happened at the cross, not at the resurrection. At the cross, Jesus is doing the hard work. At the resurrection, he's collecting the paycheck. Same thing is true for you when you're in a trial. The hard labor is during the trial. This is where you're going to labor in your soul and your heart and your mind and your spirit. This is where you're going to labor and fight in faith and hope in love in truth in the word in fasting and, and in prayer. You do your hard work in the course of the trial. Now, I want to uh, really show how we connect with the labor of the cross. In our trials, we labor just like Jesus did in his crucifixion. I want to help us to see that in this session. Jesus labored on the cross to qualify for something. When you're wanting to qualify for something, there's usually some real hard work that goes into that. You're trying to earn a certification for something. Yeah, maybe you're wanting to earn a PhD or you're after a master's or, or, or a bachelor's. Whatever, uh, it, some kind of a degree, you're, you want that diploma, you are going to work hard hard to earn that diploma. There are some careers that you actually have to earn certification in order to fulfill that career. For example, a lawyer, a cop, a medical doctor, a nurse, psychologist, a dentist, an EMT, air traffic controller, a trucker, a building inspector, a firefighter. There are a number of careers that if you're going to function in that career, you first of all have to gain certification. You have to qualify for that kind of career. And this is what Jesus is doing on the cross. He is laboring in his soul so that he can qualify for a greater office. Now, what was it that Jesus was qualifying for on the cross? He was qualifying to become the captain of our salvation. In our trials, it's very similar for us as well. When we're in a trial, many times we may not realize it, but we're actually in a qualifying meet. We're actually in a process where if we will labor and endure, we can qualify for a higher rank in the kingdom of God. There are some ranks and stations in the kingdom of God for which you must qualify. Let me try to illustrate this. Caleb. Caleb is in a 
40 year wilderness. He's with the children of Israel wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. I don't know if he knew it, but he was actually qualifying. Caleb, if you'll stay in this thing and endure through this 40-year wilderness, you will qualify. You'll come through with the spiritual authority, both with people and with God, to take a whole mountain in the promised land. Someone else that qualified through their trial was Job. Job's trial was a qualifier. And you're like, what was Job qualifying for? Thank you for asking that question. He was qualifying for his life story to become the first signpost in all of Scripture to the cross of Jesus Christ. He was qualifying to be able to write the first book of Scripture so that the book of Job, we now call it the cornerstone of all Scripture because it was the first book of the Bible that God put in place when he was building this edifice that we call Holy Scripture. He was qualifying to gain a witness for every generation. He was qualifying to be caught up in the heavenlies and to see God with his eyes. And because Job was faithful in his trial, he qualified to be a general in the kingdom of God. He qualified to inspire sufferers in every generation. So even today, people that are in pain today, where do they go? They go to Job. If you're struggling in your marriage, Job will talk to you about that. If you lose a child, well, he'll talk to you about that. If you have a, 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 a if, you, if your income stream, your, your profession, your career is just washed out, he'll, he'll connect with you on that. If you go through a great physical affliction, Joel Bull, will help you with that. And he becomes a source of comfort and help to virtually any kind of trial. It almost doesn't matter what you experience. You find comfort from Job's example. And the Lord's like, Job, if your life is going to hold this kind of compelling example to this wide diversity of needs that people experience, you will pay a price for that kind of office. You are going to have to labor in your soul for this kind of a qualifying office in the kingdom of God. And so just as Caleb was qualifying for something, Job was qualifying for something, in that very same way, Jesus Christ was qualifying on the cross so that he could serve as the captain of our salvation. So I want to talk just a little bit more and break this open. Uh, how is it that Jesus was qualifying on the cross? Well, before the cross, Jesus held many offices. The Son of God, uncreated God, eternal, dazzling in perfection and glory and beauty. He filled and occupied many offices. Here's some of them. Before the cross, he was Lord of heaven and earth, King of kings, Lord of lords, King of the Jews, the Almighty, Alpha and Omega, Chief Shepherd, Commander of Heaven's Armies, Emmanuel, Light of the World, Messiah, the Word of God. Jesus Christ was all of these things before the cross. But there were several offices that he could not fulfill, could not occupy before the cross. He had to endure the cross, qualify for these offices. And so let me just mention some of the offices that Jesus Christ now holds 
because he qualified for them in the cross. Now because of the cross, he is now your redeemer. He's the apostle of your confession. He's the high priest that serves for you in the presence of God. He's the captain of your salvation. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's the savior of the world. And to hold those offices, he had to qualify through the cross. So the cross was a qualifier. Uh, I'd like to take you to the verse that really put me on to this. Hebrews 2 verse 10. It's so good you might even want to look it up in your Bible. Find it on your device right now. Hebrews 2 verse 10. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So Hebrews 2 verse 10 is saying that through the sufferings of the cross, Jesus Christ was made perfect. It's the Greek word teleos, and it has three primary meanings. It means to be perfect, to be mature, or to be complete. And the scripture says that because of the cross of Christ, Jesus Christ was made teleos through the cross. And I'm going, okay, I'm trying to figure this out. Was Jesus in perfect before the cross, and did the cross somehow make him into a perfect person? No. Well, was Jesus somehow immature before the cross, and the cross matured him and made him a fully mature person? No. He was mature before the cross. Well, did the cross somehow make him complete? Was he incomplete before the cross, and did the cross complete him? No, he was complete God, a very God, uncreated, the third person of the Trinity, uh, the second person of the Trinity, excuse me, totally perfect, totally mature, totally complete before the cross. And yet Hebrews 2 verse 10 says that Jesus Christ was made teleos, perfect, by the sufferings of the cross. So I was looking at the verse going, I don't understand this. So I went to the commentaries, and here's what the commentaries told me. They said, the Greek word teleos means perfect, complete, mature. But they said, there is a secondary meaning of the word, and I think it's what's really at, at the heart of the verse. It also means qualified. Through the sufferings of the cross, Jesus Christ qualified to serve as the high priest of our confession and as the captain of our salvation. Before the cross, he was perfect. He was mature. He was complete. There was nothing lacking in him whatsoever. Absolutely complete and perfect. But yet, he could not serve as the captain of your salvation. Why? Because he had to qualify for that office. In order to fulfill that office, he had to go to the cross. He had to earn his stripes. He had to drink the cup. He had to go the distance. He had to run the race. He had to finish the course. He had to labor in order to qualify as the captain of our salvation. The same thing is true for us. There are some ranks and stations in the kingdom of God for which we must qualify. You go to a local university near where you live. You make an appointment with the academic dean, and you say to the dean, you go, I would like this university to give me a PhD. And uh, the dean will look at you and go, 
give you a PhD, excuse me, and you go, yes, I, I would like this institution to uh, give me a PhD. I'd like to test out of your PhD program. And the dean will go, test out of a PhD? And you're like, yeah, I want to test out. You see, I've done a lot of independent study, and I've got a lot of life experience, and I think I can ace your tests. So if you just hit me with the barrage of all your tests and exams for your Ph.D. program, I think I can ace them all. I'll pass all your tests, and you can give me your Ph.D. The dean will look at you like, what kind of a planet are you living on? If you want a Ph.D. from this inst institution, we're going to hurt you. We're going to wound you. You will come through our Ph.D. program wimping, whimpering, hobbling. By the time we're finished with you, to get a Ph.D. from this institution, you're going to have to earn it. And this same dynamic is true in the kingdom of God. There are some ranks and stations in the kingdom that we must labor for. This is what Jesus was doing on the cross. He labored on the cross so that he could earn the distinction of serving as the captain of our salvation. So now when you come to the book of Revelation, what is all creation saying? Worthy is the lamb that was was slain. And with that word worthy, we are saying qualified. You have earned your stripes. Worthy is the Lamb to receive glory and honor and blessing because you labored in your soul. The Father looked on your labor on the cross and was satisfied. And Jesus earned his certification as your Redeemer by enduring and laboring on the cross. In the same way, the trials that we, in, that we face in life are sometimes qualifying mates. They are actually qualifying us for a higher office in the kingdom of God so that we can lay our lives down even more for the cause of Christ. We need generals in the kingdom of God, lieutenants, captains who have come through a process of qualification through their trial so that they can serve and occupy a higher office in the kingdom of God. This may explain why your trial has been so excruciating. This may explain why you connect so viscerally to the cross of Jesus Christ. Because here you are in this agonizing trial, and you're trying to figure out why is the pain so intense? What is going on here? And you're like, well, if God's punishing me for something, he's really taking the thing overboard. Or if God's purifying me for something, trying to make me a better person, it's still overkill. But if he's qualifying me for something, suddenly the whole thing takes on this fantastic light. My trial is a qualifier. God is using this to prepare me for a higher office in the kingdom. I mean for this to encourage your heart in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your years. Do not give up now. Lay hold of his word. Lay hold of his promise. Do the labor.
neighbor now qualify for a higher office so that you can serve the body of Christ with even greater abandonment. I have another scripture that uh, puts uh, this thing in in a, just a little bit of a different light. I'm going to be saying the same thing in some different language here. I want to show how that God turns crucifixion into fruitfulness. And I want to use the example of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel has this challenge. He's called of God to return from Babylon back to Jerusalem after the exile and rebuild the temple of God in Jerusalem. And he has almost zero resources to do this task. So God sends a couple prophets to Zerubbabel to encourage him, the prophet Agai and the prophet Zechariah. And they're going to come alongside Zerubbabel and at a time when his resources are depressing and the challenge in front of him looms like this impregnable mountain. And the prophet Zacharias comes alongside and says, you can do it. God is with you. And he prophesies because when you're doing a great work, sometimes you need prophets to come alongside and prophesy to you and encourage you to stay with the task and to finish the job because God is going to enable you to do amazing things with depressing resources. The verse that I want to come to is in the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 7. Again, this one's so good, you really ought to look it up. Zechariah 4, 7. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. I'm going to take this verse apart. Who are you, O great mountain? The mountain in front of Zerubbabel is the building project. He's commissioned to build a temple, a house of prayer in Jerusalem, and he doesn't have the manpower. He doesn't have the supplies and the resources to pull it off and to accomplish this thing seems like a mountain to Zerubbabel. And now the Lord is speaking through Zechariah. And this is these are the words of God himself. Who are you, O great mountain? Notice that God addresses the mountain not as a what, but as a who. Who are you? Oh, great mountain. That's because mountains take on a persona. They, they almost have, have an identity of their own. All the great mountains of the earth have names. Everest, Matterhorn, Kilimanjaro, Rainier, Pikes Peak, Baker, you name it. The great mountains of the earth all have names because mountains become a who. You can probably put a name on the mountain that's in front of you. What is the mountain that you that faces you, that that says to you at to your face, impossible. The will of God can never be done here. Is it poverty, infirmity, hatred, division? What's the name of the mountain in front of you, pestilence, whatever it might be, it's a who, because mountains take on a persona, an identity. That's because many times there's actually an evil spirit assigned to your mountain, a demonic spirit assigned to resist in your life the will of God. And that demon actually has a name. So the, the Lord is speaking to the 
mountain. And he says to the mountain, Who are you, O great mountain? And then he says to the mountain, O great mountain. Now, to God, I'm just telling you, <laughs> that mountain is not great. This is actually a sarcastic jab. God is actually scoffing at the mountain because to Zerubbabel, this thing looks huge, but to God, it's nothing. And so God is looking at what Zerubbabel considers to be a huge mountain, and he sarcastically goes, Who are you, O great mountain? In another scripture someplace, the Lord said, to, to it, it, regarding uh, this impossibility, he said, This is a light thing in the sight of the Lord. I'm telling you, your mountain is nothing to God. He looks at it and sees it as an easy thing to take on. So he actually talks to your mountain and he scoffs at this mountain and he says, oh great mountain, who are you? And then with a scoffing tone, the Lord says to your mountain, before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plane. The mountain was Zerubbabel's building project. The plane would be the completion of it. Once that temple was built, it's now a plane. It becomes a plane that will feed and nurture and strengthen and enable the nation of Israel to serve God and to be his people in the earth. Our God turns mountains into plains. No, the mountain that you face Mountains, here's what we think of when we think mountain. When you think mountain, you're going to think darkness, desolation, loneliness, wilderness, beasts of prey. Only wild things are growing on this mountain. The mountain represents looming impossibilities, sinister dread, foreboding, limited options. That's the mountain. And God says, I'm going to turn all of that into a plane. Now, what's the plane? When you think of a plane, well, now you can build houses on there. You can, you've got people, population, restaurants, universities, banks, businesses. You've got orchards. You've got all kinds of limitless possibilities on a plane. Because on a plane, you can build a city on a plane. The options are limitless. The, the, the classic for me, the classic illustration of this is the city of Denver, Colorado. I don't know if you've ever been to Denver, Colorado, but it's a vast city that's built on this huge plain. And it's right on the eastern edge of the Rockies. And when you uh, go from Denver and you come to the mountains of the Rockies, it's remarkable, the topography, because it goes from plain straight to mountain. It's like you can draw a line right here. It was plain, and then boom, there go the mountains. Almost like you can draw a line. It's that stark of a contrast. And the contrast between the mountains and the plain is striking. Because when you're in Denver, you got businesses, houses, people, school buses, you got banks, you got restaurants, all kinds of activity, all kinds of stuff going on, gas stations, the whole thing. You hit the mountain and instant you start to you, you start on that mountain path and you're driving your way up the mountain. No houses, no businesses, no people. Everything stops. The mountain is this wilderness, desolate, lonely, bleak. Yeah, you got 
that odd guy that carries a rifle and he builds himself a hunting cabin up there in the hills. Yeah, you've got a little bit of activity on the mountain, but nothing like Denver. And here's what God says to your mountain. I am going to level this mountain, this place that represents loneliness, darkness, ostracization, foreboding, lack of fruitfulness. God says, if you'll labor in this thing, I am going to level that mountain, turn it into a plane, and now the very trial that seemed to be full of impossibilities becomes this plane of limitless possibilities. And now you're going to build the city of Denver because God has leveled the mountain in your life and turned it into a plane. Beloved, there was a mountain that God turned into a plane. I am speaking now of a bleak, desolate, lonely, horrific mountain. I'm talking about Golgotha. Because Jesus labored on Mount Golgotha, God the Father says, I'm going to turn this mountain into a plain, and Golgotha has been turned by God Almighty into a fruitful plain that now feeds the entire planet. Because Jesus labored in his soul, and the Father turned the cross into resurrection. When the Father turns your cross into resurrection, the impossible mountain you have been facing will be leveled, and now your life will become a plain of fruitfulness to feed a generation to the labor in your crucifixion. God will level the mountain and turn your cross into a fruitful plain for an entire generation. Let me use yet another Bible illustration to help you see what God is doing in the cross. I want to look at Proverbs 13, verse 12. Look it up. It's awesome. Proverbs 13, verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. God wants to use the heart sickness of your deferred hope and turn it into a tree of life. It all starts with hope. God gives you a promise. He gives you a hope of his deliverance in your life, but then he defers the deliverance, and when that hope is deferred, it makes you heart sick. Heart sickness is what happens to you when you have a promise from God, but you're still waiting for it. God, you said you were going to do this. How long, Lord? And in the years of waiting, heart sickness has almost snuffed out the light of your eyes. And you have wondered, God, why is it so long? Why am I still waiting for you to fulfill your promise? Heart sickness. I understand heart sickness in a very personal way. What should we do with heart sickness? I'm about to tell you. Heart sickness is designed by God to motivate us to put down roots into the Holy Spirit. If you will harness your heart sickness and reach into the depths of God's heart, reach into his word in fasting and prayer, and press into the word of God in 
your season of heart sickness, when God brings that desire into your life, he will turn the whole story into a tree of life. Why? Because you put down roots in the heart sickness, and now there's a tree here in your story that becomes a tree of life to a generation. If you don't put down roots in your heart sickness, God can't turn this thing into a tree. <clears throat> but if you put down roots in the Spirit, He'll be able to redeem your story, turn it into a tree of life to feed others. Here's the thing about a tree. It feeds more than just yourself. God wants to use your journey to turn it into a tree of life so that it will feed a generation on the goodness of God. When Jesus was on the cross, I promise you, he was drowning in heart sickness. He had a promise from the Father, but he is overwhelmed with grief and sorrow. How long? And the cross just seemed to take forever. But he stretched his soul and his spirit, and he reached into the heart of God in his crucifixion. And because of his root system, when resurrection came, God turned the tree of Calvary into a tree of life, something that was for us a tree of death and of curse, of cursing, now becomes in resurrection a tree of life that feeds the whole planet. Resurrection turned a beating post into a tree of life. And this is what God wants to do with you as well in your life. I'm speaking to someone right now who is heart sick in your journey. You're like, how long, Lord? How long do I have to hold the promise and hope and wait for you to fulfill your promise in my life? I'm saying in this heart sickness, put down roots in God and he will redeem your story, resurrect you. And when he resurrects you, this entire story is going to become a tree of life to your generation. Yes, you are laboring right now. The cross says labor, it's work. I'm saying stay in this thing. Endure. Do the labor of your fiery trial. Endure in the word. Endure in faith. Endure in love. Hold to his hand. Receive his strength and grace. Overcome by the power of the Spirit. If you do, he here's what he's going to do. Like Job, he's going to qualify you for a higher office in the kingdom of God. He's going to make you a general, a lieutenant, a captain in the army. This horrible mountain of impossibilities that has screamed at you for years, impossible, is going to be leveled and made into a plane that will now become the city of Denver and will feed a generation on the goodness of God and the heart sickness will be redeemed and your story will become a tree of life. Therefore, I bless you in your trial. I'm asking for the Lord to give you endurance to do the labor of the cross just like Jesus so that he can redeem it and make your cross a tree of life. God bless you. Come with me now, please, to part eight of this series. It's on my YouTube channel. We're going to do part eight. It's going to get even better because in this next session, we're going to talk about the warfare of the cross.